I will uh, uh, sharing with you in the next uh, 20 minutes or so uh, uh, my insights uh, from the underground. And uh, I indeed work in, uh, in diverse systems, but, uh, but I, I will base my, um, my, most of my um, uh, lecture on the lessons that I learned from uh, grassland biodiversity experiments, I, as, I've, as I have been working uh, in these uh, mostly. But I also think that uh, you know uh, you are already um, in the second day of only listening to very exciting uh, but uh, uh, intercropping systems. I also thought I should uh, broaden your perspective a bit because also if you have to write a research proposal as you have to do in the afternoons, it's important to also just look beside the boundaries of, of the systems to see if there's anything uh, useful. So that is what I try to do. I try to inspire you to uh, to look a bit further. And you have uh, seen uh, pictures like this a lot already uh, yesterday, I assume, but also uh, in the lecture of Lee Long, but also uh, of uh, Ken Gaylor, you, so you have seen a lot of um, intercrop uh, maize um, systems. And it's important these intercroppings are of often uh, only two species and, uh, and the effects are investigated after one growing season, as that is of course uh, relevant for the farmers. But if, if I take you uh, with, with me to the natural grassland experiments where I have been working on, uh, in a lot. So there are uh, experiments with uh, many more systems. So I think the minimum uh, diversity level is eight. So they go from monocultures to eight, but even up to uh, 60 species mixtures. Another important difference is that there's a, these are perennial systems. So uh, the, the, the plants, uh, you see them uh, clipped here in the, in the plot but uh, they uh, can regrow from that. So uh, the, system, uh, uh, the systems continue to run over time. So they are also long-term experiments. And, uh, and I think that is very interesting because we see the, uh, the biodiversity effects to, uh, to increase over time. And another important um, difference with uh, the system that you are studying um, um, uh, these days is that there's uh, no fertilization uh, applied. So, uh, the, the experiments deal with the initial um, soil and conditions and uh, and you see uh, often uh, that uh, of course the nitrogen uh, levels uh, decrease over over time uh, particularly if you just remember what uh, what Ken said is that um, that intercropping is more effective if the nitrogen levels uh, get lower that uh, there is an interesting link to uh, to explore I think yeah OK, already in biology, already, and Darwin already said it, that uh, if you uh, grow uh, um, um, plant communities uh, with uh, more species, there is a, is a, dry, um, is a higher productivity be, to be achieved. So he already had noticed uh, the biodiversity effect, and it took a biologist quite a time to experimentally prove this uh, prediction. But uh, over time, I, I think since uh, the early 2000s, there have been many experiments investigating the relationship between uh, uh, plant species diversity and biomass production. And uh, basically they find uh, in general often the same that uh, with increasing uh, diversity, the biomass production is increased. And we find that in the US and also in Germany, there is a big experiment. But also here in, uh, in Wageningen, we have, uh, have found uh, similar results. And, uh, and the slope of the curve that, uh, that, um, that differs with the different um, places due to soil differences and climate differences. But there is consensus in ecology that there is a positive biodiversity effect. And of course, the question is what uh, traits drive these effects? And, um, and uh, initially there was a, a large focus on the role of legumes. It's very nice that I'm after uh, the, the talk of uh, Ken Giller, because you all know that uh, legumes uh, have access to an additional nitrogen pool. And there were huge discussions among uh, the, the big ecologists uh, in, in, um, in the world about that this biodiversity effect would be driven by the presence of, uh, of legumes. In the European uh, experiments, it was particularly Trifolium uh, pratense. Um, but in the Cedar Creek, it was uh, more uh, lupina that was driving this effect. So we thought in Wageningen, we do an experiment 
Oh yeah, sorry. And you also see that in, in uh, of course, uh, the successful uh, intercropping combinations are also a legume uh, monocot combination. But we thought in Wageningen we do an experiment without a legume in the system, and then we will find that we don't find the biodiversity effect. Still, not in the first year, but in the second year, we found positive biodiversity effects on productivity. So the the this, uh, the, the effects uh, were not cannot only attribute it to, to, um, to legumes, although of course they provide an important uh, role because they can ex they can provide uh, additional uh, nutrients. And particularly if the roots of the legumes die and become decomposed, that will provide an additional uh, nitrogen source over time. So we need to think about a different um, uh, about different um, mechanisms. And the classical idea is that uh, below ground uh, um, different plant species have different um, um, occupy different space. So some uh, plant species root superficial and others root deep. And if you then grow them together, they can explore the soil more, um, more efficiently, more complete, can take up more nutrients and can also grow more. So this was really a bit, this is the niche complementarity hypothesis. And uh, this was particularly uh, expected to occur uh, below ground. And there have been also been uh, done many experiments uh, in different uh, in different places across the world. And the, and the evidence was also always so so. It was not super convincing. And last year we worked on a on a on a meta analysis where we uh, set together put together all the evidence for spatial resource partitioning above and below ground. And the evidence is really not convincing. So sometimes it matters a bit, but many times not. And particularly below, below ground, we don't find uh, that, uh, that systems that have a potential for having more uh, different uh, um, places in the soil that they uh, would uh, overyield more. We don't find that. And this is particularly due to uh, what you see here. Here you, on this uh, graph, you see uh, root biomass. Uh, for um, across different uh, layers for the different uh, plant species richness levels. And in the top part, you see the average monoculture. And what you would expect if you increase the diversity, you would expect that you find uh, the, the root distributions more even. And rather than it becoming more even, it's got becoming to be more uneven. So we don't uh, see that, uh, that um, the root system segregates over depth. Instead, they all aggregate in the topsoil layer. And actually, that is from a plant perspective, that's also not so surprising because the nutrients, you know, the fertilization and the water come from above. So as a plant, you have to be in the in the upper soil layers and not uh, should not be dwelling too much on the below ground. And if it's cr more crowded, you know, if there are more plant species, if there's a higher um, uh, root density, it's even more important for you to be uh, in the upper soil layers. Still, these effects oh, triggered to, um, to, uh, to think about alternative explanations. So what can it be? So if it's not research parti partitioning, as you see there in the, in the, in the green, there were um, um, uh, thoughts about abiotic facilitation being important, but I, I won't talk about that. I will focus on the biotic feedback. So what is uh, happening there? And there is a lot of uh, progress being made. Uh, in the last uh, decade, uh, because there's a lot of uh, rhizo rhizobiome studies, so it's not only the roots that are in the uh, um, 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 that are in the soil; it's also that the roots are inhabited with a very dense and very diverse uh, uh, microbial uh, um, um, communities, and these are expected to be important in driving uh, the the overyielding effects. And here you see uh, the hypothesis. So there were very clever colleagues of mine in the US, uh, but also in Germany. They did a biodiversity experiment. So they had a plot with different species and they applied fungicide. And that is the result you see here. So what you see is that, um, that um, the positive biodiversity effect uh, disappeared. And that this was basically due to, to the fact that um, uh, the um, the monocultures start producing more biomass if you if you if you knock out all the all the microbes in the soil if you knock out the the fungi. And 
also did an experiment uh, uh, to uh, have a little bit more focus on that. So we did a plant soil feedback experiment. And uh, these experiments start with the, the, the different soils. So we took soils from different monocultures. So uh, uh, purple, pink, green and blue. But these are two grasses and two, uh, two four species. It doesn't matter so much. Um, and with that, so we, we had the, the different soil, uh, soil microbial communities. Uh, and we, with that, we did a an, did an real experiment. So we had um, from all colors, we had the soil community and we also mixed these four um, um, microbial communities uh, together. And then we had one series that was not sterilized. So we, there was the, the, the microbial community was still alive and kicking. And in the sterilized community, we just um, we did gamma radiation. So we we killed all the living cells in the soil. And then on all these 10 uh, soil um, um, uh, communities, we planted five plant communities. So again, the different plants in monoculture and the mixture. So we had 10 soil treatments and five plant community treatments. So we had 50 uh, treatments. And this is actually what we um, Oh. What, how that looks like if you see a plant species growing on its own soil, you know, you see the plants are growing really miserable. They really do not do well. And if they grow the same plant species grow on a mixture soil, they look much greener and they're also much bigger. So that is um, you don't need to do statistics for for uh, seeing the outcome of this experiment. But I'll, I'll guide you through the uh, 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 analysis. So in the first bar, you see, um, um, uh, no, I, I say it differently. Differently, you see a soil community uh, line where we you see mono, mixed, and foreign. So mono is a plant on its own monoculture. So blue on blue, red on red. Then uh, the mon then we have the mixture. So we have uh, only one quarter of this of the own soil, and then we have foreign. So for example, how the gro uh, the plants grow, uh, the red plants uh, grow on. Um, pink, blue and green. And you see that the less of the own soil is there, the better the plants grow. Yeah, so the plant, you see that the bars, the green, the blue bars increase if there is less of its own. So this means that in the monocultures, plants are inhibited by their own soil-borne community. And if you then just, so this is basically the soil community effect. If you then add the plant species in the mixture. So here you see the mixtures growing on the mix on the monoculture soils and the mixtures growing on the mixture soils. That does not add the thing. So there, there this is really evidence for the idea that this, the soil borne community is involved in driving the overyielding effect. And then I also show you the sterilized conditions. And there you see that the biodiversity effect is, is gone because all bars are equally um, have equal biomass. But you also see that the total biomass is much is much higher, and this is a nutrient effect because if you kill the cells, there's also uh, more um, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, available for the plants. So this is um, if you do such treatment, you also should uh, take care that you really do what you uh, what you intend to do. Yeah. So uh, so the the second um, a series of bars is, is less interesting from that respect. Oh, wait. Yeah, so this really triggered a lot of, uh, of work. Uh, there, are, I have only added um, uh, three papers here, but there is now really there. I think even uh, in biodiversity research, in biodiversity, uh, yeah, research, uh, the, the dominant hypothesis that uh, niche, that resource complementarity is important is really switched now. So really look, people investigate now the importance of, uh, of the pathogen. Oh, and and uh, I think already uh, Li Long, I showed you uh, this morning before, there's the root and the root uh, are exudate, um, exude exudates that are important for the root root interactions. There are also microbes on the root root interactions and also the root exudates interact with the soil microbes. So it's really hard to, uh, to tease apart these, um, these different things. But I'll focus for the rest of the talk mostly on the effects of the soil microbes at, uh, on the plant roots and how that drives the biodiversity effect. Uh, here you see what's uh, the importance of the root exudate. But what we also wanted to uh, know is because we only 
a new um, the effect of the total soil of the total soil community and that's basically a, a black box so we wanted to uh, to demonstrate that the, the pathogens are really the soilborne pathogens are really um, decreased so in the Wageningen biodiversity experiment we have been uh, sampling a lot of uh, plant roots and we we used high throughput sequencing uh, to investigate the soilborne fungal communities and also to investigate what pathogens are then really really there we, because we all the talk easily talk about pathogens ruling the world but in plant science at least in uh, in e plant ecology we don't know what we are talking about we just have no clue um, and i think we also did a classical phytopathological methods in order to really pinpoint the effect of the of the pathogens and I don't have the time to explain everything, I, but I only can show you the the, uh, the end result. So we showed by doing sequencing and investigating uh, the fungal communities that all plant species have different fungal communities and also have different fungal pathogens. So grass grassland species, grass species have different pathogens than uh, than forbs, and that is really uh, important. Uh, and we also did uh, here are, are the, uh, the phytopathology methods that we did. So we really did bioassays where we have been growing a two species, a grass and a forb, Antoxanta moderatum and Leucantumum vulgare. And we uh, inoculated them with two, um, um, with two fungal species, Gomanomyces, that is really a grass pathogen, and Parafoma, that is a, a pathogen that is thought to be specific for, um, for Asteraceae species. And what you see is indeed that the yellow pathogen is not significantly different when added to the grass, but it reduces the, the growth of the of the of the forb of the Asteraceae species and vice versa. So the pathogenic effects are really how specific. And then yeah, if we start um, looking to the mixtures. What we, we, we find is that the mixtures, that we, the, the fungal communities in the mixtures are not the average of the monoculture. So it seems as if we are losing uh, these pathogens that are, that I, that are important in the, in the monocultures. But this was only one study and in my research group and uh, among uh, them is uh, Eline Amt. She is she's also here in the course. Uh, we are trying to figure out how that works and also how that would work in intercropping systems. Yeah, and one of the questions uh, that uh, Eline is asking, so is it is it the case that the pathogenic fungi, fungi get lost in diversity? So are there so many different smells or exudates that uh, the pathogenic fungi cannot find their hosts anymore in a, in a diverse forest? Imagine that you are on a, on a square and in and, and a, and a square that is um, on, a, on a normal day that is very um, empty and then it's easy to find a friend. But for example, on a day where there is a, is a festival or a, or a Saturday, a busy Saturday market, it's very difficult to find your friend. So is this a, is this a, the case in this system? Another uh, hypothesis that we are investigating is that um, having more plants, having higher ris richness leads also to more um, roots in the soil and also leads to more carbon in inputs and leads to more microbial activity so there can also be more competition in the soil and maybe the pathogens uh, lose the competition from the saprophytes and then one other thing that uh, was also touched upon a little bit by um, by uh, by ken this this morning there's also uh, there's not only the the bad guys in the soil but there's also the good guys and the good guys are normally considered to be the mycorrhizae fungi and uh, there's also a question about whether mycorrhizae might mediate these uh, negative effects of uh, pathogens when in a mixture. And this is important uh, to think about mycorrhizae not, not as that every plant species has uh, its own mycorrhizal network, but there are networks of mycorrhizae. So it's important, you can see in the second graph, you can see that the plant roots, the, the, two, uh, the root systems are connected to each other uh, via these um, mycorrhizal uh, fungi, so it can be, you can very it can very well be that um, the big plant uh, supports the the smaller plant uh, with um, with uh, nutrients via these um, uh, 
uh, via these mycorrhizal networks. And uh, that is another part that I think that we can uh, further explore also in intercropping systems because, because if we could get the mycorrhizae, uh, mycorrhizal fungi to work for us rather against against uh, it by because we break it, we break the, the, the connections every time if we plow the fields, that would be an interesting, uh, an interesting um, option, I think. This is uh, in brief what I wanted to uh, talk about. If you start looking into uh, into the soil, there is uh, there are treasures to be found, and I'm really happy to uh, answer any questions that you uh, might have. <laughs>